Howdy, folks. Welcome to the show. <laughs> I don't know why I said it like that. I actually regret saying it like that. So let me try again. Hi, <laughs> Danny here. Welcome to episode three of Mudlark. Today I'm sharing with you my first solo episode. We go deep into my childhood upbringing, some of my patterns in life, just giving you a pretty good overview of who I am as a person, how I exist in the world today, where I came from. I really just hope that this episode leaves you feeling less alone in any struggle that you've been through or currently going through and just hoping that you also recognize that we can have really hard shit happen and terrible things happen and also have a rich life, rich existence. So, I'm just so excited to share it with you. And just to give you a little bit of understanding of how the structure of the show is going to work, I'm going to be releasing two episodes a week. Um, You're going to get one on Tuesday and Thursday of every single week. There's, it's usually going to be a mix. So you'll get an interview on Tuesday and then usually it'll be solo episodes on Thursday. And yeah, I just want you to know how that is kind of going to lay out. And I just can't wait to continue to grow the show with you. So without further ado, let's move on to the solo episode. Felt my body kind of tighten and get funny. And so I decided to stop recording and like take a deep breath and kind of explore why that felt so fucking weird to me. And I walked in right as I had like shut it off and was like sitting there breathing. And I told him, I was like, I don't know why sharing my story feels so funny and how, you know, I started this podcast because I believe that our stories are what connect us. But I'm asking you guys, you know, I'm asking my guests the the questions and I just think I have I know that I have a block around taking up space in life and I've like always put myself in these roles of leadership ever since I was really young where I'm kind of like you know steering the ship and I I mean part of that's like my control part of that is being a Capricorn in like every every possible way Um, but in those roles I've also taken even though I'm like in the front of the room, I'm kind of taking the spotlight off me and shining it onto you. And it's my practice to be okay speaking slower and speaking my truth and sharing my story. And I'm going to, I'm going to work on that. I'm going to work on that starting right now. So yeah, here we go. (laughs) I, um, I'm 29 years old. I'm a Capricorn. Like I said, I'm, I was born two days after Christmas in Portland, Oregon. I have my mom, Kristen. I have my dad, Toby. They are divorced. They have been um, most of my life. Um, my dad is disabled. He has a disability. He uh, had a brain aneurysm on my first birthday. We talk about this in episode Three, I believe, uh, with Kristen Cruz, my mom, and he's he's always been a part of my life in some way, but in a lot of ways, not as a dad. Um, his aneurysm uh, took his short-term memory away, and it just has always been really a tricky thing to even talk about. You know, it's like I don't know any different, but I also believe that like my subconscious knows that something's missing. And so when I talk about my dad again, I just get like kind of weird and blah, 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 like kind of shaky about it. And I don't really know why yet. So we'll just have to keep digging there, um, together. But anyway, I, I grew up mostly like in Portland for about the first five years of my life. Um, my mom, then got together with my my ex stepdad. He's no longer in my life, but he is my sister's biological dad. My sister, her name is Sasha. We're four and a half years apart. Couldn't be more different from each other. Uh, she's a Cancer. She's born uh, July fourteenth, 
And I mean, not only the way we look is so completely opposite, but just the way we exist in the world. Um, We love each other in like a really huge, almost painful way. (laughs) But we like also just kind of, we can almost like hurt each other more than anyone else in the world. If you have a sibling, um, maybe with, maybe it's an age difference thing. I don't, I don't really know, but it's such a tumultuous relationship. It's so weird. It's like, I've never loved someone so much, but I also just want to like kill her half the time. <laughs> My mom's like, it'll get easier. I'm like, I don't know, maybe. <laughs> um, so mom, Sasha, Randy, That's my old stepdad. We were living in Portland up until I was five, like I said, five or six. And then we moved up to Mount Hood in a town called Rhododendron, where I spent the better half of my life. A small town right at the base of Mount Hood. Um, We, yeah, we just grew up there. We grew up, we were mountain kids playing outside all the time, um, going to the river. It was where we were living. It's a beautiful place to be raised we had a really rough home life with my stepdad so he's no longer in my life he is he is in Sasha's life some but he was just incredibly emotionally physically across the board abusive to all of us and my mom she was such a young mom and you'll hear through the episode she talks about that relationship quite a bit And I mean, I just get it now, you know, when you're young, she was so young, two kids, like it's easy to just stay in situations that don't serve you. You know, it's easy to stay where, you know, the bills are getting paid and at least you can have food on the table because your kids need food. And yeah, it's, it's taken me a really long time to get to a place of forgiveness. Um, It was easier for me to forgive Randy I feel like because he was like gone he wasn't in my life I didn't have to see him anymore but to like fully forgive my mom has taken me a really long time um we're super cozy close now uh she's she's incredible she inspires me in like so many ways and we're also very very different but we connect I think on like the spiritual level in a big way my mom and my sister and me, we're all just, we're pretty intuitive and we just, we feel things in a big way. And yeah, I just, I love them. So see, this is where I get funny. I'm like, I'm taking up too much space. I'm taking up too much time. So I'm just going to take a breath. I was a, I was a really wild child, you know. I I would spend my weekends out on my grandparents' farm. They were my dad's caretaker, and caretakers, and so he lived out at the farm. They live out in Malino, Oregon, and I, yeah, I would spend my weekends out there. I would play in the like little fairy forest, and I had a couple of friends that lived close by. So I just spent my weekends in heaven it felt like heaven after like rough weeks like weekdays at my home on the mountain but it just always felt to me like this kind of like this grand escape like I had this little secret haven that I was able to kind of escape to and I even had like quite a bit of guilt about having that when my sister didn't like my grandparents weren't her biological grandparents so she was just always home she came out with me like a couple of times like I can like count on one hand the amount of times my little sister came out to the farm with me I wish I would have taken her out with me more but my my grandparents they they definitely have kind of played this role of like surrogate parents to me because they did so much of the work that my dad just wasn't able to do and they've really impacted the way that I show up in the world especially with my creativity they're both phenomenal artists they my grandpa he was an architect he's a photographer a painter my grandma she was an illustrator she did courtroom drawings she's 
one of the most amazing artists I know. (laughs) And of course, I'm a little biased, but her work is incredible. I'll actually attach um, a couple of photos of her work in the show notes. She painted this stunning picture of Mount Hood where I grew up. It's actually hanging in our house in Montana just because whenever we're there, I just always feel this like kind of missing of my home. And so if you ever go stay at the Montana house, you'll notice little Oregon scattered all over the place. (laughs) And yeah, she, my grandma and I have always been really, really close. We've always connected just in like this. How do I explain it? See, again, I need to take another breath. Hold on. (laughs) Bear with me. My grandma and I have always just connected in the way that we see the world and see and believe in people. And I think my grandpa and I have always connected over spirituality more. Uh, They consider themselves to be Buddhists. I don't really know if they still do. I think they're just kind of, they're just deeply connected to something. I know that. They're both really into poetry and I know that they just find deep connection through their art and my grandpa he's been practicing yoga my whole life which I think subconsciously was definitely imprinted on me since I was a little girl because I am a yoga teacher those of you who don't know uh, I've been teaching for the last six years and he wants to connect even more I I definitely have some blocks and pain with my grandparents I love them again more than anything. It's it's such an important relationship that I have with them. There's also like any relationship, I think just like this pain woven through, especially family, you know, it can just be so tumultuous, but you know, with them being in that parent role, but me being independent like I am and have been for most of my life, there's just been kind of this pull. Like I know that they wish that I would spend more time with my dad and they wish that I would call him every week, you know, but it's just, I just don't see it ever being what they wish it could be. And I'm grateful because I feel like lately I've actually been able to voice that in a more true way of like, I can't always do what you want me to do. (laughs) And they're starting to maybe see a little bit more of why I feel the way I do towards my dad. Um, so let's go back a little bit. So I'm I'm growing up on Mount Hood. I I really struggled in school. I I think socially I did okay. I I'm very extroverted and playful and I laugh a lot. And I was always kind of taking on this like class clown kind of role. I was like, I'm just gonna make everyone laugh. My teacher is going to fucking hate me. It's just inevitable, but at least I'm making people laugh. So I just definitely went down that road. Um, Neither of my parents went to college. So I think there was just like already this belief in me of, of, ah, school's not my thing. And because I like stepped into it that way, I just didn't take it seriously. And I honestly like, I know it was kind of self-perpetuating but I had the hardest time absorbing any information you know my teachers would be talking to me and I just like couldn't it just was not possible to retain information and just a couple weeks ago I was talking to Hai about that about how I honestly felt like I had a learning disability for most of my school experience And he pointed out something that just like made me instantly feel so validated and okay. He was like, well, you know about Maslow's hierarchy of needs, you know, when your needs aren't being met, your basic needs are not being met. How on earth are you expected to take in anything else? And I was just like, holy shit, mic drop. Um, Because home life was so hard. I just, it instantly gave me just this feeling of oh no wonder poor girl (laughs) so I I went through school I barely graduated high school I had to go to an alternative program um I just like 
got pretty lost in relationships as soon as I was able to. I had my first boyfriend in like fourth grade. It was just a little like whatever playful thing, nothing serious. And then I just like, I feel like I just started falling in love with people really easy, really fast. There was like Stephen Brown when I was in sixth grade. Um, I was in love with Peter Albright for like most of my childhood. And um, yeah, I just had like these big, almost like debilitating crushes. And when I got into high school, I had my first like major love, um, Alex. I was 16 years old. He was 15. I just died. I met him and I died. (laughs) And we were in our relationship for maybe like nine months, maybe a year. I, it's so fuzzy, but I, he was like that first big love where it was semi reciprocated. And basically it was kind of just out of left field. Um, he broke up with me and let me just paint the picture for you. So we were spending like that whole summer together. It was like the first time having like sleepovers with a boyfriend. Um, we didn't have sex, but we like fooled around did everything else. And I, I remember one time like being out on the deck of my mom's apartment. This is the place that she moved after leaving my stepdad. Um, so yeah, she left my stepdad and then I like, she left my stepdad and then I found this relationship. So I think it was just like feeling seen and loved by a boy for the first time in my life. It was just so intense. And I remember this moment of being at the apartment. He was sleeping over. I think my mom just felt guilty for all the shit we went through. So she's like, yeah, sure. Have your boyfriend over. And we slept out on the deck. And I remember we were sitting in like this chair, lounge chair thing. And I remember us just like looking at the stars and it felt like a storybook. I'm like, this is it. This is the man I'm going to marry. And I remember him just like looking at me and saying, I love you so much. And you know, when you're just like young, if you've ever experienced young love like that, you just like can't eat. Like you're sick. You're sick in love. And I, I was like that at such a heightened, in such a heightened way for that whole relationship that when he came back from his mom's, he was visiting his mom in Vegas and wanted to have a talk with me after his band practice. And it was the breakup talk. I was so ill prepared for that kind of blow that it literally fucked me up for so long. Like I'm not I'll I'll get more into that in a bit, but painting the picture of the breakup, it was right after his band practice, and I had showed up at his house house with one of my best friends at the time, just so giddy. We hadn't seen each other in weeks because he was in Vegas. I was in California visiting some family, and I show up just so ready to get right back into this lovey dovey incredible relationship, and he had me go outside with him and I was like, Ooh, (laughs) make out session. (laughs) I was like, what's going to happen? And we were standing on the front yard and he looked at me and he was just like, you know, I just thought a lot when I was at my mom's and I just think we need to take a break. You know, it just, it's gotten really big. And I remember now I didn't remember it at the time, but like, or piece it together. But when I was in California, I remember talking to him on the phone and he's like, you know, I I think we should probably not say I love you. Like that just feels really big and fast. And, and I was like, okay, yeah, sure. Of course. No, that you're right. That's way too fast. Just cause I, I didn't want to like lose him. Um, but yeah, I guess I should have saw it coming a little more, but I was, I'd never had that experience. So you don't know what you don't know. And so, yeah, he's like, I just think we should end it. And I was so like stunned and my nervous system like fucking exploded. And I literally hit the ground like I fell. I fell over. I couldn't even like hold up my body. 
I think back to that moment and I'm just like, oh my God, you poor thing. Um, hit the ground. He like tried to kiss me goodbye and I'm like, no. And I think at that time my mom was visiting her best friend out in Montana. So I didn't even have my mom to go to. I was staying with my friend. And honestly, that breakup impacted, I mean, all my relationships forever. I mean, they st- it's still something that I have to, like, I have to consciously always say, how can I soften? How can I open to this person? How, and right now it's my husband, you know, it's like every moment, don't, don't seal up, don't be hardened and, yeah, it's just been so, such an impact. It was such an impactful moment in my life. And I think it's like when you grow up with so much like harshness and darkness in your home and you experience light and love like that for the first time, it can be really, yeah, just really intense in every way. So breakup happens. Um, After that, I'm like, fuck it. I need to find some boyfriends. (laughs) Like, yes, plural. (laughs) And that's when like my, I feel like my relationship addiction really kicked in because I just, I couldn't feel, I couldn't muster up the strength to feel what I was feeling anymore with the breakup with Alex that I just found all these replacements. Like I very quickly... I think just started dating one of his best friends because it was someone kind of close to him and maybe he would kind of feel like him or smell like him. And then I just went on to dating a lot of people, dating a guy who didn't go to my school. He's the guy I ended up losing my virginity to. And it was just like a really psychotic relationship. You know, I was like 18 years old and it was just, we were insane. We were in insane like super anxious attachment to each other but then when we were together we like hated being together it was a shit show so somewhere in that mix I guess it was yeah it was during that relationship with that guy from another school whose name I will not mention because I'm trying to like smudge his name out of my life (laughs) I'm kidding it really wasn't the worst but um, I dropped out of high school temporarily to move to Lincoln City with my cousin Afton. We were living in a fully infested fucking garage, eating Carmelo candy and drinking Pepsi like as our meal replacements. I got like pretty chubby and well chubby in my eyes. Um, But yeah, we were just it was gross. I started working at the Gap Outlet, you know, I'm like, this is the life, you know, I'm living on the beach. I'm, I I get to eat whatever I want. And finally realized how fucked up it was that I was doing. I needed to go back to school. I needed to finish high school. Um, So I ended up moving back. My mom would not talk to me. She wouldn't come get me because I I was just so shitty to her at that time that I was that was like when my anger really started to show up with my mom was late high school. I just didn't know why I was so angry at her. And so yeah, I was like living on the coast and not talking to her. And when I was like, Mom, help me, I wanna come home, she's like, figure out how to get back here, you carless little asshole, basically. So my grandparents <laughs> they bailed me out of that situation. Um, I was pretty financially dependent on them because they, you know, they were these surrogate parents and they would just like give me money when I wanted. Basically that started when I was in high school. I actually got into quite a bit of trouble. I stole from them. My grandma one day was like, it was my friend's birthday and I'm like, can I have like 40 bucks to go to the mall? We're going to her birthday. I don't have any money. She's like, yeah, sure. Just take the credit card. And I'm like, okay, wow, limitless fun. So I I went to the mall, put money on the card, um, more than 40, of course, um, not much more, but then continued to totally abuse that and take their card when I was out there. And they just didn't notice. Like they were, I just took advantage of them. It was like so fucking gross. I still like 
cringe when I talk about it. But yeah, I just I started going down this path of like stealing and being sneaky. And then I started lying more and it was just a mess. Um, I somehow found a way to graduate high school, went back, like I said earlier, uh, went and did an alternative program. And that's like basically where they're like, okay, you need to finish this packet, which takes, you know, what, five hours to like finish a packet. And that's like a credit. And it's like the easiest thing. And I still barely, barely graduated. Um, But I did. I certainly did. And chopped all my hair off. My hair was like, I have really big blonde hair and my hair was like probably halfway down my back and then just decided to chop all my hair off and like went shoulder length, straightened it, like stick straight. I actually will attach a picture of my high school graduation picture because it's fucking hilarious and I'm standing next to uh, my high school best friend, Scott. We're still friends today. It's just insanity. So I graduated. I moved out instantly. I got a roommate. Sounds like I kind of started to get my shit together, but not exactly. So I got this roommate, move into a condo, um, saved up money, but also like got some help from my grandparents. Oh, fucking A. Sorry, guys. So I got caught stealing from my grandparents. Like they finally noticed. I didn't wrap that up. They finally noticed and called the police and told them to like scare the shit out of me so like they didn't want to press charges but they had the cops like come to my mom's house and sit me down and I just remember I was in such deep shame but all I could do was like look so pissed off like just frowning and I was slouching and the cop was like do you understand I was like yes I was so fucking pissed (laughs) but really I was sad and ashamed and so yeah Learned my lesson mostly, but I even did some more stealing after that, which we might get to. If you're lucky, if you're still here, maybe you're like, this this chick is messed up. What is, what's going on? I have to share it. I have to share it. I want to paint the picture. That's what the whole podcast is about, digging through the mud. So that's what this is. This is the depth of mud. Um. Anyways, so I move out. Um. I'm like, having sex with everybody. I didn't have like one set boyfriend. I just started like hooking up with everyone. I was definitely placing my worth in the hands of all the dudes that I was like hooking up with. And I got pregnant. Go figure. I got pregnant. I found out randomly um, my cousin was over And she was taking like 14 pregnancy tests because she was like 110% positive that she was pregnant. And I was like, I'll take it was literally like a knocked up scene. Um, It was the same scene, (laughs) basically. And then I went and took a test and I was pregnant and my whole world shifted. I was like, holy hell. I'm going to have a baby. I didn't even go to that place of like, you know, like maybe I'll have an abortion. Like I didn't even go there. And the reason, sorry, Charlie just flopped on the ground. I think the reason why is like, I just, I wanted love so bad. I wanted to feel what I felt with Alex again so bad that I thought maybe this baby would bring me and this guy Matt together. Like maybe he would really see how amazing I am and what an incredible mom I could be. Mind you, I'm 19 years old. I'm a shit show. I'm like quarter of the time in college. The other like 75% of the time I'm working at Joe's Donuts, like selling donuts. (laughs) And so I have this information about being pregnant. I call my mom. She was awesome. She said, you know, I support you either way. Um, I went to Matt a couple days after to tell him in person and I just went to his house he was downtown Portland he's quite a bit older than me 26 27 
I was like, he'll handle this like a man. He'll really, he'll see all this. He'll be, he'll help. And basically told him and he just screamed at me. And I don't think I ever talked to him again. Like, I think that was just it. I, it's fuzzy because that time was so fuzzy, but definitely not the response I was expecting. Um, so I left and drove off in my little beater 84. What the hell was that? It was like this sick little Toyota. It was orange. It sucked. It broke down. I would like, you could like tear the fabric off with your fingers like very easily. It was a mess. So picture that. Um, I ended up miscarrying uh, a few months in and I look at that now as the biggest blessing in disguise ever. Um, right before the miscarriage happened, I remember my grandma and my aunt sitting me down at this diner in Sandy, close to where I grew up, begging me to get an abortion. They were just like, this is going to be the, this is going to ruin your life. And that also like really stung because my grandma did the same thing, said the same thing to my mom when she was pregnant with me. And I remember just being like, I remember saying that I said something like, you know, you told mom to do the same thing and I wouldn't be here. So it just like, I just remember feeling so emotional and then I miscarried and I like, didn't even want to tell them. I was actually like with my grandma for part of that, like part of my miscarriage. I didn't know that's what was happening, but anywho, so that happened. I kind of cleared all that out and then I started dating. It was just like, I swear to God, I can't even keep track. I have it written out. I actually have a timeline in one of my old journals of my series of dating that I did because I couldn't keep track. I was like, who was I with then? Who am I with now? So yeah, I ended up having a boyfriend move in. We then got a different apartment eventually. And I basically spent about three years, maybe two years, 19, 20, 21, three years, just testing the waters, being a wild child. And then I would like be in these relationships and I, I just couldn't feel anything like I did when I was younger, you know? I like didn't know how to go there. I didn't know how to feel that way again because I was I it hardened me so much. That breakup just hardened me in the biggest way. And then I ended up moving to Portland. There, a lot of stuff happened in between then, but that is long story short. I moved to Portland. Things actually did start to shift for me, even though my relationship, like my relationship ways were still pretty out of control and unhealthy. I, I got a job at a brewery. I was bartending. I started getting really into fitness and running and I started a run club. And that's when like the entrepreneur in me really started to shine. And I just started to find this really cool life in Portland and I loved the brewery that I was working for. I got really into craft beer. I never was a drinker. I never drank when I was young. So it was kind of fun to like learn about beer in a environment like a brewery. You know, I'm learning about the process and I ended up meeting Grant, who is my most previous partner. We were together for just under five years and he totally changed my life. He was the best. He's so kind and loving and creative. And we ended up moving to Northwest Montana together when I was 23, maybe 22, I think 23. We moved to Northwest Montana to help open a brewery together. So we got hired on by two local ladies of the town near where our Montana house is, mine and my now husband. Um, and we got the brewery up and rolling. We got a house together. We were really into hiking and foraging. And it just, it was so amazing. And 
then my old habit started to creep back in where I would, I would cheat. And I was like living this dual life kind of, you know, we had this, this life in Montana and then I would travel back to Oregon to go do yoga stuff and do workshops and trainings and hook up with this married dude. Like it was fucked up you guys. And it wasn't that long ago, which is why it's like, how am I talking about this? But this is like, this is the mud. This is the truth. This is what I went through to get to where I am today, which is in such a better, brighter, lighter place. Um, but it just, it, when you are cheating and if you are not able to be truthful with your partner, I am the girl that you need to talk to because I learned so much in the last four years of my patterning, of why I was doing that, of where it came from, like even from my childhood and from that relationship with Alex. To go back to that, Alex, have you ever listened to this? You fucked up my world. (laughs) I'm kidding. You didn't. You were great and taught me so much. But I have just learned so much about where cheating comes from and I'm excited to share more about this because I am no longer a cheater. I've never cheated on my husband and it's something we talk about all the freaking time. But basically, um, I was hitting my Saturn return and we'll talk about that too more. I'll give you a little link of what a Saturn return is in the show notes so you can get it like a brief explanation. Um, But basically, I was going, just beginning my Saturn return, and I like to think of that as like when the universe sweeps in, swoops in, it's like when the universe swoops in, and your life is a bucket, and the universe grabs the bucket and flips it upside down, and anything that's not like stuck to it like glue or gum is gonna go. Like, let gravity do all the fucking work, everything's gonna leave, and you're going to start over. And so that's literally what happened. I I had opened a yoga studio in that town. I ended up closing it after two years. Grant and I had just bought a house. We ended up, um, I ended up just getting my name off of the house instantly. I mean, like a month after buying it, you guys, um, I met my husband in the midst of all of this shit show in my rock bottom, um, which is a beautiful story. And surprisingly, the most beautiful thing that's ever happened. And yeah, my whole world got turned. And basically, I met my husband, my stepkids. They were in my kids' yoga class. So I met them before I even met Hi. Hi and I will talk about our story of how we met in an upcoming episode. I'm really excited to share that with you guys. It's a lovely story. It's a huge, amazingly monumental story, actually. But I met my husband, and this is the moment where everything started to turn around. This is the moment where, for the first time in my life, after 26 years of being alive, I like let myself be seen fully for who I am. He, he met me at such a raw time tender moment that I literally could not hide anything. So he knew all about the cheating. He knew all about the stealing. He knew all about the lot. He knew about everything. And he loved me, you guys. Like he loved me. (laughs) I'm like, how? (laughs) Wow, do you love me? And it's literally been through him loving me and him seeing me that I've been able to find my way home and it's cheesy, but it's true. It makes me emotional because it's, we all, no matter what we have done, no matter what we have been through, no matter who we've hurt, we are all so worthy of love and belonging and connection. And he has just been my mirror into all of the ways in which I am beautiful and strong and powerful and all of the ways I need to love on myself, all the, all the things in my life that are still hurting from my upbringing. It's like he, he shows me that. He, 
He's been like this roadmap to all of the places in my life that need my love. And now to give you a more present day, we got married a year ago. We're coming up on our one year of being married. We've been together for four years, almost four years. So well, actually three in March, it'll be four years. Um, but we started out in Montana. I spent um, the early part of our relationship back in Oregon for like seven or eight months. That's when I bought my first Airstream and I was living back at the base of Mount Hood just to get away from Montana, get away from my previous partner, just let some air flow through that town and let kind of like the dust settle. And then my husband begged me to come back. He's like, give me a year. Give me a year here and we'll figure out a way for you to um, also live in Oregon. Just because this is this is home, guys. As I love Montana. It's a huge part of my, my heart. Um, home for me is the Pacific Northwest. It's being near water. It's being near my family. But it was like fucking scary. I was like, how can I be with this man who has two kids in Montana? And it just, it, none of it made sense. And that's something I'll say about when you find your person, even when it doesn't make sense, there's like this part of you that just knows you have to do it. And that's how my experience has been with high of just like, I mean, you look at the situation, you know, three years ago, none of it made sense. He was living in a place I didn't want to live. He has two kids ex-wife like all of these baggage you know and I'm like free and it it just didn't make sense but I knew I had to and now we are splitting our time between Oregon Montana Um, he spends a little more time back there so he can spend time with the kiddos but they spent the whole summer here in Oregon we just built a house on some property out here our town that we're in now is called boring (laughs) all the boring jokes, bring them. Um, and we rent out our Montana house when we're not in it. I'll link the Montana house. Um, cause it's gorgeous. We actually have created kind of this self-led retreat vibe. So when you go stay there, we have it all set up for you to just do yoga, take Epsom salt baths. It's the, it's freaking magical. And then we also, um, have our Airstream here that we rent out and we own a couple businesses. I'm waist deep in my yoga teaching. I teach multiple classes weekly and now I'm doing this podcast and now I just shared with you a bunch of really raw shit about my life and my relationships and I'm sure that you instantly were like holy shit like relationships That's what most of what I just talked about was. And I think that comes from connection being the most important thing to me. But up until meeting my husband, I didn't realize that the connection I was like so hungry for was just a connection to myself again. And when you grow up just not belonging in your home, you know, you're just constantly seeking something outside of you to feel at home and that's what I was doing. And I've never felt more at home than I do right now in this moment. And I'm just so grateful. And yeah, I'm going to take another deep breath. Maybe you'll take a deep breath with me. Want to? Let's take an inhale. And exhale. breath work has been a big part of my healing process. I have to take lots of pauses sometimes in the middle of a conversation as you witnessed. And it's just, it's really helped me ground. It's helped just my anxiety. It's helped everything. So I'm excited to share more breath work with you guys as well. But anywho, I hope this gives you a little feel for kind of what I've, what I've gone through that. I'm not this fancy ass, sassy, blonde girl just living the life of her. I mean, I am actually living the life of my dreams now, but it didn't come from an easy 
upbringing. It didn't come from unicorns and rainbows. It didn't come from peace even. It came from really a lot of pain and hard things and depression and anxiety. And we'll get into all of that in more depth um, with our guests. And I hope you just know that no matter what you are going through, what you have been through, you deserve light and love. And I'm just so excited to continue to dig through the mud with you. I love you guys. I'm going to go drink a lot of water and maybe eat some watermelon and just lay on the ground for a while because I kind of want to puke a little bit from what I just shared with you, which means I probably should have shared it with you. So thank you. Love you. And I'll talk to you soon. Bye. Well, what do you think about that, (laughs) y'all? Thank you so much for listening. It's a lot and I'm owning it. I love you so much. Thank you for being here. I want to remind you, please don't forget to rate and review the show. If you haven't subscribed yet, please hit that beautiful little button. It's an important one. This helps the show get heard by more folks who could possibly really benefit from the things that we're sharing here at Mudlark. So do that. Send me a screenshot of that once you're finished, and I will shoot over a lovely guided meditation that I made just for you. Thank you. Talk to you soon. Bye.